Jews demand miraculous signs, and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and Christ the wisdom of God. And I want to start off with the back and forth, repeat after me these, this next verse. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. It's a very strange way to live, isn't it? Really kind of emptying one's self. This strange way to live that we, we just sang about. And, and, you know, I know people multitask. Maybe you want to, sometime during the service, just flip back to, to 270 again and, and think about, meditate on what these words really say. Listen to them once again. Just as I am poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, yea, all I need in thee to find. O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because I promise I believe. O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am, thy love unknown has broken every barrier down. Yea, to be thine, yea, thine alone. O Lamb of God, I come. I want to challenge you to think about your life in these days at this Lenten tide as we are working our way to Easter to Holy Week, where we will remember that foolish thing that God did for the sake of his extravagant love and grace, that he left his throne in heaven and came among us and lived his sinless life so he could give it up for people just like you and me. And the foolishness of it all, really the foolishness of it all is this, that if all y'all out there had lived perfectly, sinless life, and I was the only one in all of history, I was the only one of all people who had ever lived that broke God's law, he would have come for me. Just as he came for you. See, sometimes we, we get this idea that there's, there's just this kind of out there love of God somewhere. And it's not for you, each one of us. That, that there are sins of the world and certainly things that we do that are displeasing to God, but we've kind of got this, this like we slather it sometimes when I, when I have a great peanut butter sandwich. I want all the edges, you know, uh, of the, of the uh, bread covered. We kind of slather it on like peanut butter on our life and say, well, <coughs> we're just going to have grace cover all four corners. Well, the part that doesn't, we'll just cut those edges off, you know. And, and, and that we, we look at the world and our relationship with God as one of kind of his general love. But the foolish, foolishness of this message is that it goes way beyond the general love to a specific love for you. God sees you so precious that he would do anything for you to be with him forever. That's foolishness, isn't it? And, and he calls us to live foolish lives along with him. And, and, and today, I, I want to challenge you really to take a, an inventory. And we're going to use Exodus chapter 20 to do this, but take an inventory of your life and consider the areas of your life where, where you are standing in the wisdom of men, in the power of men, and not the wisdom and power of God where you're living a life that would not reflect the foolishness of Christ. 
And when you're standing in your strength, and in your strength alone, and not absolutely dependent on Him. You see, you see that kind of reflection, that kind of, that kind of examination is exactly what Jesus was doing with the money changers in the temple. Now, when, when you hear the story about the money changes in the temple, not many people understand the way it works because we don't do things like that anymore. We, we, we say, well, God must be against commerce. Of course he's not against commerce. He loves business people. And, and he blesses business people too. It's, it's not an issue of commerce. And it's not an issue of, of talking about money in church. That you ought to separate politics and money from anything you say in religion. That's not what he's saying. It's simply this. The Jews had figured out that the people of God trying to be pious, trying, thinking they were doing the right thing, had figured out a way to settle this problem of bringing a sacrifice to the temple. Say you lived up in, in Greece or Italy or, or in Turkey, and, and you wanted to come down to Jerusalem like God told you to and bring a sacrifice, a sacrifice of, as he commands, the firstborn of your sheep. Say you wanted to do that. Well, are you going to grab that little lamb, carry him underneath your arm all the way, like, like you know, people through the airport carry these little dogs? You know, carry him all the way to Jerusalem and sacrifice. No, what, what folks says, that's too hard. And what happens if the animal dies? So what you'll do is you sell it there, you bring the money here, you change your money into temple money, and then you go and buy a little lamb. It makes sense. It's, it's wise. It's easy to transport money, a lot easier than it is to transport cattle. But what ended up happening was what became a wise thing in the eyes of the world became a business. And, and instead of supplying a service of need to, to people, it became a means of profit and the whole thing turned from a spiritual relationship, a spiritual experience, into money, to one that was just about money. And Jesus, it says, he put together his cords and he came down and beat the bejeebers out of everybody. He whipped them. And he looked at them and says, how dare you make my father's house a house, a den of thieves, and a marketplace? How dare you move what God has commanded into something, something that's, that's simply a means for you to make some money? How dare you lose the foolishness, if you will, of the sacrifice where God says if you will but give me the firstborn of your cattle if you will trust me in this I will make sure you are taken care of for the rest of your life I'll do that for you but you gotta trust that I love you that much and you got to stand in that hope and in that relationship. Friends, thinking about that, is that you? Not that. <laughs> I am so, I'm glad you're here. You know, what, what a blessing. But, but kids act as kids act. We can't afford, we, we're adults. We're mature people in Christ. And we can't live the foolishness of this world because the foolishness of this world says you got to watch out for you. The foolishness of, of this world says God doesn't love you like that. He'll just take care of the end game, you know? We all die, we all go to heaven, it'll be okay. You're responsible for everything here. After all, what is the most quoted Scripture verse that doesn't exist in Scripture? God helps those who... It's not scriptural. It's nowhere in the Bible. It's put together by people 
who wanted to make the foolishness of God into something wise that they could understand. All I got to do is help along. All I got to do is make it work. You know, God will get me started, but I'm on my own. You're not on your own. If, if you were on your own, you'd be in so much trouble. You think about this. Really, when we pray, our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. We are praying honestly and honestly believing that God provides for us everything we need to support this body and life. And that if we believe honestly that we can take better care of ourselves than God can take care of us, we are living in the wisdom of the world and not embracing the foolishness of God. For in the end, it says in, in the Psalms, the eyes of all look upon you, O Lord, and you give them, you give them their food in due season. It, it, it says in, in Scripture, in, in James, is what are you, you a mist? You, you, think, you think you're going to go here and do this and do this and do this and all, all those things that you think you're going to be able to accomplish? It says, how can you make anything happen? Really? How can you do that? You can't even tell me that you're going to be around tomorrow. Right? Who knows? Maybe the world will end. Maybe a drunk driver will hit you. Maybe you'll fall asleep going home. I don't know. You can't even depend on you to show up tomorrow. But oh, can you depend on God? And you can depend on his extravagant love. And so I want to challenge you to think about this. And we're going to go over just a couple of things. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 20, if you will. Exodus chapter 20 is so on page 118 for those of you in our, our pew Bibles uh, looking along. And I, I, I want to use this, the Ten Commandments we've heard before, and everybody kind of knows them. But, but I want to do a little more reflection on this just, to, just so that at this time of Lent, you're examining yourself really to consider, is this my faith and hope? What's the first thing that it says? The Lord spoke all these words, the Ten Commandments. He declares who he is first. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. That's how it starts off. It says, I'm the guy who's walked with you up to now. I'm the guy who stood with you. It's kind of like with, with my kids. Every once in a while, when the, the kids were little, they would come to me and they would say, you're not taking good enough care of me. And they'd say it in all kinds of ways. You know, like, how, where's my dinner? You know, how come I'm, I can't eat? Why aren't you getting me to this place? I'm, I'm disappointed. I'm tired. Or I'm bored. You're like, I'm supposed to, to, to spend my life making sure that, that my children are, are, are happy. And for that moment, for every moment that I'm supposed to dedicate myself only to my children, when they don't understand, the lawn's got to be mowed too. And somebody's got to go out and do grocery shopping, right? And somebody's cooking. I was doing all those things. And they look at me and say, you're not taking good enough care of, of me. I said, wait a minute. When you were little, this little, I was changing your diapers. I was staying up all night with you when you were sick. I was cleaning you up. I was teaching you. I was playing with you. I was walking with you. I was seeing everything up. And now you're saying, you don't love me enough? Friends, are you looking and a relationship with God where you're saying he's not loving you enough and forgetting the message of the cross and his wondrous love that's poured out for us at Calvary. Forgetting how he's seen generations and generations. He's watched over us as a nation and as a people and given us freedoms that that Frankly, even with the strength of our military, as strong as it is, without God's hand, we would not be free. We think it's our nation. 
But even our founding fathers understood in God we trust, right? Because he's the one that has brought us to this time. So I, the Lord your God. Then he says, <coughs> first verse, first one. You shall have no other gods before me. What is, what is he talking about? He says, don't make yourself an idol. You know, there's some people here still in America and still in our world who follow idols. There's some Hindu folks and others who will build an idol and worship that idol. For the most part, that's not us. For the most part, our idols that we worship are concepts like individuality. It's important to be an individual. But that does not trump a relationship with God or freedom or my rights or democracy or commerce or my, my own self-satisfaction or what I want out of love. We, we put this and say, this is what I'm going to dedicate myself to, not to what you want me to do, but I'm going to dedicate myself to this over here. Those are our idols. And Luther said, an idol is anything that you look to Anything that you look to to get you out of trouble when you're in trouble or from which you expect all good things. And so I want you to consider what is it that you're expecting to receive to receive blessings from or to get you out of trouble? Really? And that takes some, some looking. The first thing you say is, well, let, let me look at my checkbook. Because that, that'll tell you what you prize, right? Some people prize security. Some people prize having stuff. Some people prize a steady paycheck. Some people prize, uh, you know, opportunities. And I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with commerce. What I'm saying is, don't make that your God. That's the wisdom of this world but rather that we stand in absolute dependence <laughs> on a God that has shown us such love that, that he himself would come and die for us. That's something you can grab onto. And then it says, that as, as it goes on, I, I, I want you to read verse 5 and 6 with me. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. Come on with me. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. We're going to go on from there. Keep your finger there. But did you hear that? God's, God takes this so seriously that the way that you're acting now in relationship to him can affect your children's children. That's serious. That, that, that my, my chasing after my own way in this world can become a characteristic that will flow through generations and God will not bless it. But here's what he says, but showing love to thousands of generations of those who love me and, and, and keep my commandments. He says, this relationship, if you, will, if you will but trust in what he has done and his word of truth, he says, your blessing is going to come. And it's not going to be a blessing like some guys talk and say, well, you're going to win the lottery or uh, your kids won't have cavities or they'll get into the better school. You know, God's going to take care of you. No, it's blessings beyond that. It is the relationship with him that's the blessing. And it's a relationship that is from this day all the way through to eternity. It doesn't change. It's not like you have this part of your life, this world, until you die, you live your own way, and then you start living for God. He says, no, today is the day of salvation. Right now is the relationship, and I've made you my own. You are my child. You are my heir. And so today... Today's the day for you to express that relationship and to live it. And that's why he says the next commandment is verse 7. Read it with me. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Now, he's not talking about cussing. Well, that's a part of it. 
And I won't give you examples of this. I am going to give you examples of misusing his name, though. Because what God has called us on uh, to use his name is in every trouble, at every moment. He says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Psalm 50, 15. He, he calls us to, 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 to pray to him and absolutely have this dependence on him, understanding that it is only from his loving hand that we receive anything. Only from his loving hand that, 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 that we've received ourselves into his rela a relationship with him in our baptisms. Only from his loving hand that any of us could be child and heir. And that he loves us so desperately that he calls us to a foolish life that trusts. Trust with reckless abandon. That, that, that he is never going to leave us and he won't forget us. And so we pray to him, not just when we are in trouble, not just when we've got something that we want, but we're in this constant dialogue saying, God, show me. Show me your truth and lead me. The next section. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor and, and do all the work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. Read the rest of it with me. On it you shall not do any work, neither you nor your son nor daughter nor your manservant nor your maidservant nor your animals nor the alien within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that's in them, but he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath and made it holy. What's talking about here is very simple. This relationship where we say, I, I, I don't have to do it all. Because he's in charge. I don't have to worry that I haven't worked hard enough because he's in charge. Now, I'm not suggesting that you should be lazy or sit and fold your hands and just wait for everything to, to, to uh, drop into your arms. That's not what he said either. But this absolute dependence saying, if I'm going to get it, if I'm going to receive, I got to do something. Do something that, that frankly is in the wisdom of man and not the foolishness of God. The foolishness of God that he calls us to is one that says, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. The foolishness of God says, Lord, I need a deeper relationship with you. And I know, I know that I have been working hard. I've been thinking I can do this on my own. I know that, that you've told me to trust and it's so hard for me to do it, oh Lord, Help me just to stop. And that's why he put in, all I think, all those examples of, okay, it's not just you. Don't have your kids do the work instead. Don't have your animals do Don't hire someone to do that work instead. He says, I want you to spend your time in relationship with me. Friends, how is your relationship with God going? I mean, your listening relationship. I mean, your submission relationship. I mean, your hearing relationship. I mean your asking relationship. I mean your waiting relationship. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and his word do I hope. I wait for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they that watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord. Waiting and listening for what God's calling you to. Friends, that's a foolish way to live, but it really is the only way to live. There's, there's so much more in this book that we have to talk about. And, and we do that on a regular basis. Very rarely will we say, here is everything you need to know about the Ten Commandments. This is just getting you started. What I want to begin today is that, that kind of examination. If you haven't done this, an examination of, of your life. And really think about, what are you putting your trust in? Are you putting your trust in your strength, your own strength or ability? Or are you, are, are you ready to say, Lord, I can accomplish nothing except by your hand and in your love. So lead me, guide me, keep me, strengthen me. Are you worried about what's going to happen for you the next day or the next week? And, and, and saying, I've got to work really hard because I've got to take care of me. And I'm not saying don't be a good manager. But I, what I am saying is this incessant need that we have to self-satisfy and to secure our own futures 
is foolishness in God's eyes. For he says, you're worried about tomorrow? Do the sparrows worry? Do the lilies of the field worry? I know every hair on your head, and I love you. I won't let you fall. I won't let you fall. My kids, every single one of them, I was teaching them to, to ride bikes, right? You've been through this. You walk along behind, and you walk along behind holding the seat, holding the seat until they get their own balance. And there's that moment of freedom when they say, I can do this, and zoom, off they go. With all of the momentum and none of the wisdom that any of them need, right? Friends, this is a day for, for, for you to let God put his hand back on the bicycle seat and really consider whether or not you're depending on him to hold you upright or you're off on your own. It goes like this. Remember? The foolishness of God. Go for it. The foolishness of God, foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. Is wiser than man's wisdom. And the weakness of God, weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. He will see you through, and you can depend on him. Amen.